So this talk will present about, about reproducibility, transparency, and adaptability with uh, SnakeMake. <clears throat> so uh, just that we are all on the same page, I want to quickly summarize what I think a data analysis is. Um, so that is usually the process going from some kind of raw data, which could be a measurement or some other kind of data set uh, to some kind of final results. And usually this process is quite heterogeneous, consisting of lots of steps that probably convert data formats, transform data, filter data, aggregate data, create plots, and so on and so forth. And uh, depending on the field, that might be all in the same language. It might also be quite heterogeneous, being a combination of, I don't know, command line tools and scripting languages, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, one can just do that by hand, stepwise, iteratively, looking at the data, transforming it, modifying it, plotting it, and so on to obtain the results. But whenever you start scaling this up, um, it will kind of kind of uh, fail at some point uh, to be reproducible, uh, or uh, you will have to have uh, a lot of work for documenting everything very, uh, very detailed. So um, it's kind of desirable to automate this process to make it uh, reproducible. And um, Obviously, reproducibility is very important. Lots of people talk about this nowadays. Um, but if you think about what reproducibility actually delivers, um, it basically gives you the ability to check whether an analysis is, is computationally valid in the sense that it delivers the same result over and over again if you repeat it. Um, or if you apply it to uh, some new data, it's probably ideally qualitatively the same results that you can confirm something uh, on the new data, for example. Uh, however, um, that, is, that is not everything that makes uh, an analysis um, of high quality or of sustained value. And for, for really achieving something that has a lasting value beyond maybe a single publication uh, that is kind of interpretable and understandable by others, and that is also maybe useful for yourself, in the future, one has to additionally consider uh, two other aspects um, that I would like to call transparency and adaptability here. Um, so transparency um, allows somebody else who is not the author of the analysis to, to understand what is actually going on there so that the code of the data analysis is not just a black box or just some spaghetti code like 2000 lines of scripting language code or whatever, but instead is, is somehow written in a way that the methodological validity can be checked by a reviewer, for example, um, and that others can understand the analysis. <clears throat> and the third aspect, adaptability, uh, allows the author to later on modify the analysis in a convenient way without rewriting entire things of it, um, to extend it towards new research questions. And of course, that is not only limited to the author, but can also be done by others in the field. And this makes an analysis really uh, valuable for a scientific field because then others can build on each other's work and so on. So those are kind of, uh, I think, desirable uh, properties of a data analysis. And in this talk, I would like to um, outline how, how SnakeMake um, as a framework can help to achieve this with a minimal additional effort. So SnakeMake is a tool that is around since 2012, actually. And since we count downloads in 2015, it has been downloaded over 700,000 uh, times uh, and has uh, in total over 2,000 citations. And, and last year, for example, we had on average 10 new citations per week. So it's really, really widely used. Um, as you see here from the papers below, there's some kind of a focus towards uh, life sciences. But that is just historically. Uh, technically, there's no particular reason that SnakeMake is not used in other fields like physics or, or just math or whatever. And actually, that is happening a lot as well. So it's just historically, it's coming from bioinformatics and therefore the, the majority of the papers are coming out with it still in this field. But technically, there's no particular reason to limit it to that field. Okay. So um, I, I will now go through these aspects, reproducibility, transparency, and adaptability, and for each of them, show how Snake make, um, um, makes them possible. So we start with automation and readability, which kind of drive both the reproducibility and the transparency. Of course, if the code of a workflow definition or data analysis is unreadable, it cannot, can never be transparent. And if the analysis does not happen automatically without manual steps, it also cannot be reproducible. 
So how does SnakeMake um, offer these, these properties? Um, so first of all, the key idea of SnakeMake is that a data analysis or a workflow is uh, defined in terms of rules. And each of these rules basically describes one step in an analysis. And um, these rules are defined in a text-based language that is actually a syntactical extension of Python. So kind of, you can see it like as a, as a Python dialect or a domain-specific language based on Python. And this language allows you to define such rules, which basically describe steps in an analysis. So each rule can have a set of input files, a set of output files, and something that describes how to obtain the output from the input. And that something can be the invocation of a command line tool, but it can also be a script or a notebook, as you will see later on. And these input and output files don't need to be concrete, but instead they can contain wildcards, like you can see here, this sample thing that's a placeholder for something uh, that is variable and can change for different data sets, for example. And this is not limited to single wildcard, but it can be multiple ones so that you can use this mechanism to, uh, for example, scan a parameter space. And outside of such rules that SnakeMake allows to define, you can write arbitrary Python code and even inside. So for example, for obtaining um, input files and output files, you can use Python code. So that makes it a very powerful system because you basically have the entire power of Python as a language. So the idea of SnakeMake is that it then takes such rules, so whatever you define as steps for your data analysis, and combines them automatically by matching input files against output files, and by that it obtains a directed acyclic graph of jobs like this. And this is then basically the execution plan so any parts of that that are independent of each other can, of course, be executed in parallel. And SnakeMake allows to configure its execution to um, um, make use of whatever resources you have avail available, be it a single machine or a cluster or the cloud or whatever. OK, so uh, as mentioned, you're not limited to invoking shell commands. Instead, you can also directly integrate with uh, scripting languages like Python, R, and Julia, and even non-scripting languages like classical HPC um, uh, or high-performance languages uh, like Rust, for example. And um, the scripting integration works by specifying the path to a script. And then, um, depending on the language, uh, you can write the script in whatever, whatever is the idiomatic way in that language. Uh, what's special about this and quite unique as far as I know to SnakeMake is that inside of these scripts, you have direct access to all the input and output files uh, of the rule and any additional properties. As you see here in the Python case, we access, for example, the first input file and here the first output file. In the R case, it's the same, just a different syntax. And in the Rust case, again, the same. So what is nice about this is that you can avoid writing boilerplate code for particular steps of your analysis, parsing parameters into that step, uh, reading input files, and so on. But instead, you directly access all of these properties of a, of a rule definition from the script without all of that boilerplate. And that boilerplate can usually, like in a complex data analysis, can make 20 lines of code or so, and you avoid that like this. So what is the benefit? Of course, it's, it's then very easy and ad hoc to modularize your analysis in a very fine-grained way to have single steps that uh, generate a single plot, for example. And by being very short, these scripts become very readable and transparent at the same time. So that's kind of the idea. <clears throat> then, of course, um, it can also integrate with Jupyter Notebooks, which are very popular for uh, interactively designing data analysis. The nice thing about notebooks is that you can, in the browser, code your analysis in whatever language you want. It has support for lots of things like Python, R, uh, but also other languages like Julia, for example. Um, however, um, the downside of just using a notebook for data analysis is that you, again, have something like spaghetti code because it's a linear thing and you have just, in the end, one big file containing, in the extreme case, your entire analysis. This is, this is not ideal. So therefore, um, what, what SnakeMake offers with its integration with notebooks like this here, um, similar to the scripting thing, is that you can have many very small and, uh, and thereby understandable notebooks um, combined in a single overall analysis that composes them together uh, into, into individual steps that generate individual and simple to understand things. That is kind of the idea. And um, this, this works even in an interactive way. So, so you can specify just a path to a notebook without the notebook existing already. And then you can run SnakeMake and tell it to open up that notebook in a draft mode where 
it's just containing some skeleton and you can interactively uh, edit the notebook until you're happy with the results, save it, and SnakeMake will automatically reuse that saved notebook the next time you run this on a different data set or whatever. So that you have the interactive um, benefits of a notebook combined with the modularity and the scalability of, of SnakeMake. Okay, there's another option to generate the output from the input, and those are so-called wrappers. Um, wrappers are meant for reuse, uh, reusable steps in an analysis that maybe are very popular and occur often in a particular scientific field. So, for example, in bioinformatics, where I'm coming from, we have a tool called SAM Tools that is basically ubiquitously used to um, analyze some, some uh, very major kind of data set in, in our field. And instead of just invoking this tool, in each and every workflow that needs this kind of step, you can in SnakeMake just refer to the corresponding wrapper. And this wrapper then, then does all kinds of things. So it invokes the tool in the right way, maybe add some uh, mandatory parameters and so on, so that you don't have to remember this all the time. And at the same time, the wrapper also takes care of automatically deploying the tool to your system in the right version that is compatible with the implementation of the wrapper. And there's a repository for these wrappers where you can, can take them from, which has hundreds of, of wrappers available. Of course, they are kind of, again, focused a bit towards the life sciences, but this is open to everybody. And there are also non-life science uh, related wrappers in here. Okay, then there are lots of little gimmicks in SnakeMake. Like for example, you can mark output files as temporary and then SnakeMake will take care of deleting them once they are not needed anymore. Um, so when all consuming jobs uh, have been finished, the temporary file will be automatically deleted by SnakeMake. Um, you can do the opposite and write protect output files if they are, for example, particularly expensive to generate and you don't want to risk accidentally deleting or overwriting them. And you can mark output files as so-called pipes. And in that case, they will be streamed to the consuming job instead of ever being written entirely to disk. Um, SnakeMake also allows you to combine workflows with each other. And for this, it has a so-called module system where you can define a module with a name. And then this module points to a particular SnakeMake workflow definition, which can, for example, come from GitHub, but can also come from any other uh, Git repository or GitLab or whatever, uh, or even a local um, um, working directory. You can pass on configuration values to these modules, and you can decide what parts of such a module to use. This is similar to a Python import statement, just this imports rules from this given module. And um, this allows you to not only use another workflow in your current workflow, but also to combine multiple workflows. So for example, um, you could have a second module here, uh, which uses a different workflow, um, pass on some different kind of configuration, and again, use, use the rules of that module or only, only a part of those rules and so on. And then at the same time in your current workflow, you can extend these two external workflows with some additional rules like here, uh, which for example, combine the two into an integrative analysis or whatever. Okay, so just an example, of course, this can work in any domain with any kind of data analysis. Okay, uh, next aspect I wanna talk about is scalability, which is of course important to being able to reproduce an analysis, thinking of some big data analysis. Um, if you cannot scale it to your local infrastructure, you're not able to reproduce the results of somebody else. For example, if which happens a lot and unfortunately still in a lot of publications, for example, if an analysis is conducted on a particular compute cluster and totally tied to the specific architecture of that cluster, um, porting this over to another cluster is, is really a hard task if, if you don't take care of this from the, from the beginning. And SnakeMang makes it particularly easy to take care of this. And of course, Scalability also drives the adaptability also for yourself, like because your infrastructure might change in the future. And if you want to reuse your old workflow um, that is probably tied too much to your old infrastructure, then you also run into the same kind of trouble. So how does SnakeMake um, handle this scalability? That has different, different aspects. And um, the center, at the center of um, SnakeMake's uh, scalability support is a scheduling algorithm that you see here. Uh, this is basically a mixed integer linear program. And I, I won't go into the details here for the reasons of time, but just very briefly, basically the, uh, um, 
The objective function has has several targets which have different priorities. So first of all, the first um, term here maximizes the priority of the selected subset of jobs at any point in time during the analysis. So basically, at any point in time during the analysis, SnakeMac has a set of jobs that it could execute because all of their input files have been already generated. And among that set of jobs, it has to select a subset such that given constraints are satisfied, like um, given resources, um, maximum parallelism, and so on and so forth. So first of all, it tries to select jobs such that the priority is maximized. And this priority of a job can be specified, for example, in the snake make workflow definition, where you define a rule, you can assign it a particular priority. Usually all the jobs and rules have the same priority, but sometimes you want some part of the analysis to be executed sooner than any other part. And for that purpose, we have this priority optimization. The second term maximizes the parallelization over the CPU course. And the third and the fourth term uh, maximize, uh, minimize the lifetime of temporary files. Uh, this relates to this temporary file output thing that I've just shown before. Um, so which means that um, whenever a temporary file is generated by a job, uh, in the subsequent steps, SnakeMake will try to schedule the consuming jobs as soon as possible so that it can delete the temporary file as soon as possible. And then we have some constraints, and the first one is the most important one. So this one is um, used for every resource that is given at the command line when executing SnakeMake, and that is um, primarily the number of CPU cores you want to use, but in a cluster or cloud system, it might be the number of nodes you want to use at the same time. And it can be things like uh, the amount of memory you want to, the amount of shared memory, memory you want to use um, by all the selected jobs at some point in time. So for example, if you work on a shared compute cluster, you probably want to limit the amount of memory to some, some hundreds of gigabytes to not overwhelm the cluster with uh, jobs that consume too much memory and things like that can be done. So that shows you that already at the com computation or at the execution time, independent of the definition of the workflow, SnakeMake can be configured to use the hardware in the way you want it to, to use it and uh, the given resources in a way you want wanted to use it. And um, the second aspect of scalability uh, uh, is shown here, and this is so-called DAG partitioning. So um, imagine that a workflow can be very complex and can consist of lots of steps. And these steps have, have, uh, have different run kinds of runtimes. So for example, there might be very long running steps and others might be really, really short running. Now, if you are in a cluster system, where, uh, for example, you usually on average need to wait like half an hour for a queue job to be actually executed. You probably don't want to um, submit a job that just takes like, I don't know, five seconds to execute um, to that cluster system as a single job, because then it will just wait half an hour in the queue before it's executed for five seconds and then goes on with the next. So that would be kind of a waste of time, okay? So in order to adapt to such cases without rewriting your workflow, just to like group stuff together and so on, SnakeMake allows you to group jobs together at the command line while, while executing and not while defining the workflow. And you can, for example, um, say, um, let's imagine that this blue job here, all these blue, do blue jobs here are long running. So maybe they take two hours and all the green jobs here are probably just a few seconds, okay? So what you can tell SnakeMake is to group the green and the blue jobs together by saying, well, the group of A, which is this blue job here uh, of rule A shall be group G1, and the same group shall be assigned to the rule B, which is the rule responsible for all the green jobs here, okay? So what this tells SnakeMake is that it shall um, connect uh, all jobs that are in the same connected component um, into one group. So this and this job are connected to each other and they are assigned the same group. So they will be submitted in a cluster system together. Okay. And the same happened for this pair of jobs, for this pair of jobs and so on and so forth. Okay. So by that, by that you can easily attach each green job to the um, preceding blue job. Okay. And if you, in case this is still not enough, you can even configure this further. And by saying that um, um, a certain group shall, shall, shall span multiple connected components. And for example, here we say that the group G1 shall span two connected components. So what you see here is as a result that we always get four of these jobs grouped together and submitted together to the compute cluster. And of course you can make this more extreme like 
putting all of them in the same group and so on. Okay, and that can be, of course, as, you, as I've now uh, outlined, very beneficial in case of uh, a cluster system. Um, it can also be very beneficial in case of clouds because that would minimize the network traffic between jobs because like, for example, putting all of these together on the same node um, would allow to just reuse the output files that are already on the disk on the node instead of just waiting for them to be put to them to some object storage before and loaded again on the subsequent jobs and so on. Okay, so by all of these mechanisms, SnakeMake workflows can be scaled to virtually any kind of major platform. So from single workstations over compute servers, clusters, grid computing uh, to cloud systems. And um, all of that can happen most often in case uh, at least uh, you follow the best practices uh, without modifying the workflow definition. Okay, uh, just, just a quick thing about scalability. Uh, there, of course, especially probably uh, in math, MPI is, is also a thing. Um, so SnakeMag also has MPI support, and that simply works by providing MPI as, a, uh, as an additional resource here to the rule, and then you can use it here. And why it's defined as a resource, the reason is that we can overwrite this resource when invoking the workflow. For example, choosing a different MPI executor, okay? And by that, um, this, this kind of parallelism can be handled. Um, of course, it also supports non-MPI parallelism. In that case, you just specify a number of tasks and you can use the tasks here to pass it on to the script or the tool or whatever, and SnakeMag will know about this when scheduling the job. Okay, <clears throat> so another aspect of scalability uh, is, uh, comes kind of from a different angle. So far, I've always talked about data analysis in the sense of going from some kind of data sets to some kind of results. And these data sets are usually kind of project specific. Um, however, um, in many cases, uh, such an analysis has, has an additional input and this I would like to call shared data. So that can be all kinds of things that probably reoccur in different kinds of analysis depending on the field, okay? So for example, in my field, this would be like, for example, the human uh, reference genome, which is needed in a lot of analysis. And um, that's a big file and you don't wanna uh, download that all the time again, whenever you uh, compute a new analysis and probably sometimes you have to also post-process your shared data after you downloaded it from some kind of databases. And um, all of these steps are prob probably computationally expensive and you don't want to raise resources on them um, whenever you do a new kind of analysis on a new set of data sets or so. So in uh, order to um, make this more efficient, SnakeMake um, provides a mechanism that is called between workflow caching. So by default, um, SnakeMake will of course avoid redundant computation. So if you have run an analysis and recomputed, it will only recompute those parts um, that you probably change where you change parameters and so on. That will happen automatically within a single analysis. With this between workflow caching, um, SnakeMake is even able to um, see automatically that you have computed a particular kind of shared data or intermediate result beforehand on a different, um, uh, in a different workflow Maybe that is even a completely different workflow that just shares some individual steps with your current workflow. And in such a case, SnakeMake will be able, if you configure it uh, accordingly, to take the result from a global cache that can be, for example, set up for your research group or for your institute or for your cluster or whatever. So how does that mechanism work? So basically, SnakeMake sees upon um, determining the execution plan all the necessary information to know what kind of output will be generated on an abstract level, okay? So it sees the source code, it sees all the parameters, it sees the software tools and the versions that are needed for each step. And out of that, it can compute a hash value. And it can also know, like, since it knows which job depends on which, it also knows, like, um, if a downstream job is needing the results of some upstream jobs, it basically compute, can compute a derived hash value that takes into account the code of the current step, but also of the, uh, the hashes of the input. So this is kind of like the principle behind blockchain hashing. So it takes a hash of hashes, generating a new cache uh, entry hash. And with that, it can look up in a, in a global cache um, whether a certain intermediate result has been computed before. And in that case, it can just take the result from the cache instead of recomputing it. 
Okay, um, so we are nearing the end. Um, now I want to talk about portability. So I've already mentioned here, SnakeMac knows about the software and the versions. So how does it actually do this? Uh, so one option to do this with SnakeMac is that you can define for each rule a software environment. And this works via using a, a system called Conda. That's a so-called package manager that can deploy packages, uh, scientific software mostly, to your local machine um, without requiring admin rights. So it's not a system-wide package management like on Linux, DNF, or apt-get, or whatever. But instead, it can install packages to whatever paths you define, like in your local uh, home directory and so on, without admin rights. And that is uh, what is very nice about Conda is that it supports isolated software environments. And these software environments can be used by SnakeMake. So you define, for example, that this rule shall use the following Conda environment given in this YAML file. And the YAML file defines that this environment shall consist of this tool and this library in the version specified here, okay? So upon invoking this and telling SnakeMake to use Conda for the deployment, it will automatically deploy this environment to your machine and run whatever shell command or script or whatever is defined in that rule inside of that environment, okay? And by that, um, you can run the same workflow on, a, uh, an, on an unprepared different machine that just has SnakeMake and Conda installed, and it will execute this step and any other step in exactly the environments that are defined here, okay? Of course, there's a different option, and that is containers. You probably all know about those, um, Docker containers, uh, Singularity, or uDocker, or whatever. And SnakeMake also supports that. In that case, you just define a, a container image via a URL here. And um, then the container is used and whatever step is defined here to generate the output from the input, um, this is happening inside of the container, thereby ensuring the same kind of reproducibility as with Conda. However, there's kind of some difference between the two. So Conda is more shallow. It's not defining the environment down to the system libraries, but instead just a shallow set of um, um, tools and libraries on top of that, on top of glibc, for example. Uh, whereas a container is really fixing everything except the operating system kernel. And um, if it's run on, on Mac OS, for example, it's even, even taking a particular kernel because it's rather a virtual machine than a, actually a real container. But on Linux, it's, it's a more lightweight and doing everything instead of the, uh, except the kernel. So therefore, you can easily imagine that the containers are a bit more secure in the sense of fixing the environment even more than a container uh, than a conda environment but they are less ad hoc you have to write something like a docker file upload stuff to some kind of um, global uh, uh, publicly available registry or some local registry of course as well and that is all more effort than just writing a single yaml file like this here okay um, so therefore snakemac offers a third option which is containerization and the idea of containerization is that you write your snakemac workflow just with these Conda environments defined. And then SnakeMake can automatically generate a Docker file for you that contains all of these Conda environments. And you can use that Docker file uh, at, or the corresponding build container inside of your workflow like this. And if SnakeMake is then run, um, it will take the Conda environments from this container instead of redeploying them every time. So that is, first of all, uh, some kind of uh, computational, um, less expensive approach. But at the second time, it's also kind of a snapshot of all these Conda environments, which is, again, then encapsulated into a container with all its benefits of more security and more, even more reproducibility than Conda. So you have kind of the best of both worlds, the ad hoc way of developing with Conda environments, which is very quick, transparent, and and easy to do and easy to change of, uh, at the same time. But then upon publication or upon going into production or whatever, you can containerize the thing to get even more uh, stability and robustness. <clears throat> okay, uh, last thing I wanna talk about is transparency. And here, importantly, most importantly, um, this is driven by, of course, the ability to document um, your analysis and also the ability to actually trace upon accessing the results, how each result was actually generated, okay? So this can just happen by providing a GitHub repository with your code and maybe whatever, uh, some kind of zip archive with lots of results and you just assert 
the user or the reader of your paper that the results have been generated with that code in the Git repository, for example. That's a way, and it's certainly a, a good way already. But uh, with SnakeMake, you can go a bit further. And this works by um, the ability of SnakeMake to generate so-called self-contained HTML reports automatically out of any data analysis. So what do these reports actually offer? So first of all, they give you an overview over the analysis and the dependencies and the individual steps. You can uh, click those steps to see the details, like what is the input, what is the output, what software was used, and what command or code or script was used to, um, to generate this result, okay? Um, so we can also look at like one of these plot rules and then you see like in case of a, a script that you actually see the plotting code for this thing, okay? So what is already the benefit over the Git repository is in this case that um, you have the uh, code um, in, in, a, in a more interactive way and the user or the reader does not need to navigate the source code files, but instead can do this in a more graphical and visual way, okay? Then you get some statistics for free, like runtime statistics, when was stuff, stuff generated and so on. And finally, and most importantly, SnakeMake allows you to attach results like plots you generated, tables you generated and so on to these reports, okay? And that then is the new thing because this connects the results semantically with the source code without having two separate things like a Git repository and an, an archive of results or whatever. But instead, everything is in one interactive interface and that comes for free. You don't have to code that every time you, you want to do such an analysis, okay? So this uh, result um, view offers you like the different different items you generated. You can annotate like how they are labeled here. Uh, and um, by clicking on this uh, I button, you see them here. Um, you can also hide this stuff. Uh, you can look at uh, details about this, like descriptions of what was generated there. This, of course, you have to write yourself um, or use ChatGPT or whatever to do it. And um, you can jump, like, for example, from here, and this is the most important thing, to the corresponding rule that generated this plot. So by clicking on this I here, I actually see the code and the software of the rule and so on. So this is what I mean with uh, maximizing transparency in this case. And I see these re reports kind of as a supplementary file of the future. So instead of having a PDF as a supplement with lots of plots in or even an archive with lots of additional plots in. Uh, you can just provide such a report in case you did your analysis for a paper with SnakeMake. And ideally such a report should contain all the figures that are in your main paper and in the supplementary file um, again. But this time they are connected to the source code, to the parameters, um, to the software used and so on. So people really can see without running this again can already see whether stuff makes sense, whether the choices for generating this plot were valid, um, for example, if a statistical test was used or whatever, and um, that you basically get for free. You just need to annotate some, some simple things in your snake make rules by saying, well, this output file shall be included into this report with the following labels and the following description, and the rest happens automatically for you. And these reports are self-contained. You don't need a server process for them to host them or whatever. They are just um, in, the, in the simplest case, if it's small data, they can just be single HTML files, including everything, including the results. If your results are starting to get bigger and too much for the browser memory, you can generate a report as a zip file, which then contains an, contains an HTML file and a data folder next to that HTML file. And people can just unzip and uh, uh, open the HTML file and see something like you see here. OK, um, then uh, just, just one other thing. Um, there are lots of users of SnakeMake. I already mentioned that. And um, the web is full of uh, predefined SnakeMake workflows defined for single publications, but also um, meant to be, uh, some of them meant to be reused. And there is the so-called SnakeMake workflow catalog, which can be used to explore all of such workflows that are hosted on, on GitHub. So basically this automatically scrapes GitHub, searching for certain keywords and trying to check whether this is really a SnakeMake workflow. And if that is the case, it occurs in here. And there are two categories. This is the all workflows category, and this is the 
one um, where workflows have to follow higher standards for usability Hat and reusability FSB and, and those SM. are contained here. FS für 24 stops auf Spur 18 bleiben. Okay. Um, oh yeah, and actually the standardized usage is really a, a useful thing because if you click on this usage button, you actually see for each of these workflows a five-step instruction to run them. So first including um, installing SnakeMake itself, deploying the workflow, configuring it with some instructions um, on how to do that. And um, finally, followed by running the workflow and generating the report. And that uh, even takes the burden of you to document these things um, for the users to some extent, because this is always the same. You basically only need to document how to configure the workflow, like what are the parameters uh, and the files needed and so on. So that can be very helpful. Okay, so to conclude, um, SnakeMake uh, is, is a system for um, doing uh, data analysis in a reproducible, transparent, adapt and adaptable way. And it achieves that by um, allowing you to define a workflow in a particularly human-readable specification language that is meant to be easy to understand, even if you're not an expert in the system. Um, it uh, allows uh, to, to use quite extensive modularization capabilities and thereby uh, reuse um, your code from different previous steps, uh, combine it into new stuff, and so on and so forth. Being modular is always good uh, to increase the transparency because it makes it easier for the user to navigate to the part of the analysis that actually matters to them instead of needing to read an entire spaghetti code of, of analysis that contains all the steps that you actually want to conduct. But instead, the users can easily like jump through the modules to the rules where, where the plot or the result that they are interested in is generated. And by that, um, avoid understanding the entire code base if they are just interested in one aspect. Um, by its execution on our platforms and the integration with package management, it becomes particularly portable and scalable. And via the interactive reporting, it allows maximum kind of transparency, um, especially for people who are not experts in the system, who just want to see the results and connect them semantically with the decisions about how to obtain the results, what parameters to use, what's method to, what methods to use, and so on and so forth. And uh, many of the ideas that I have presented today are also repeated in this uh, official SnakeMake paper which is meant to be a rolling paper. So it will be updated whenever SnakeMag re receives a new major feature. Therefore, we have published it on F1000 um, so that we can just update that paper instead of writing a new one every two years or so. So you are invited to, to have a look at that um, because it details on many things that I've shown here. It also gives you an overview over this idea of transparency, reproducibility, and adaptability. And also it provides lots of design patterns that are useful for using snake making in all kinds of scenarios uh, that are beyond these simple examples that I've shown here in the slides. Okay, with that, I would be happy to take any questions. So let's